Alrighty then. Hi, Vermont history students. As I always say, it is time for Unit 8, uh, which is, uh, what, two-thirds of the way through the semester already. And uh, Unit 8 is composed of just two sections. I've been tinkering with the outline today, and I cut it back a bunch, so it's kind of streamlined. And uh, one section covers the years about 1904-1905 up to World War One, and then the next section covers the 20s. And so I just want to talk about those a little bit for you and explain them. Uh, but first, as far as the housekeeping on the course goes, I have three papers, uh, Trevor's second and Ava and Anna. What it's worth, I'm going to do them today, I promise you. Uh, and uh, so let's make this movie and then I'll get down to the business of it. Um, also, um, there's only one person who's replied to the discussion question for Unit 7 so far. It's right now about 11.30, so I'm hoping when I finish this, and go to put it on YouTube, the, uh, there will be a couple more um, replies. It's part of your grade, you know? I mean, it's the part of your written portion of the course. So, uh, you know, I keep going back over old ones. If you want to make up missed work, uh, your fellow students may not benefit from really late comments to old discussions, um, but it will be factored into your grade. Um, I think is really fair and appropriate um, for me to reward you uh, for making up work that you um, could have done on time. Uh, because I'm an easygoing guy, and I want you to be happy. And uh, so, and then there's a town meeting, of course, next uh, Monday. Uh, the town meeting it, last time, uh, four people participated, uh, three up pillars and a downhiller. And uh, the uh, answers were sort of like, uh, to some extent, all over the place. There seemed to be sort of unanimity uh, among the uphillers, for the most part, about the documents. Um, some of them came in differently than I expected. I didn't expect uphillers to say that people who left the state are still Vermonters. But if that's the way you see it and you describe it articulately the way you did, it's fine with me. Um, and so, you know, with six people, three and three, it's sort of hard to really get a sense of sort of like the unity. Uh, how unified Vermont was at various times um, through this exercise. It's easier when you have 25 students, you know, and you have four villages of six. Uh, but, uh, you know, enjoy each other's comments uh, as far as the town meetings go. Uh, and I commented, I replied to them, and so hopefully my comments um, are helpful too. So I think that's all of that, um, and I'm not going to beat you over the head with too much content here. Let's get through it, which is the first section of the unit outline is about the aftermath of when tourism got big. Tourism got big in the 1890s, as we've already outlined, and then there was a bunch of social conflict over its new dynamics and how it was um, affecting the relationship between the uphill and downhill portions of the state, and that resulted in a bunch of sort of social conflict, including um, the uh, conflict over the 1902 election, which really sort of culminated it, was very much of a take back Vermont kind of thing. There's no real Vermonters running in uh, we're going to end prohibition just so that tourists and Catholics can have drinks and the whole thing. Uh, and after that, um, I have a couple, just a couple small things. I wanted to give you a model for then what happens is now that once you get into the second and the third uh, decade of tourism being such a huge factor, downhillers have to wrap their brains around exactly how they harness it in a way that they can use it to improve and and developed a state, but not in a way that makes it so they destroy the very thing they're selling, which is Vermont's backwardness. And a model for this is, I tell briefly in the outline, the story of this guy Lyman Simpson Hayes in Rockingham at this beautiful old meeting house they had there, which was unused for 50 years up until 1906, 1907. And this guy Hayes, who was from New York and had retired there, formed a old meeting house association and mostly took it upon himself to fix up the meeting house. And um, there were all these gravestones that had fallen over. And as tourism increased, uh, and he was like hammering and nailing and painting the inside, tourists kept disrupting him, interrupting him, coming in and saying, can you show me where the gravestones of my ancestors are? And so out of the goodness of his heart, Hayes alphabetized the gravestones, and which is a sort of a metaphor, I mean it's a crazy thing to do, but it's a metaphor for, he didn't move the bodies by the way, he just moved the stones around. It's a metaphor for exactly how are downhill is going to go about rearranging and fixing up and improving the state so that it meets tourist expectations, but not in a way that destroys the integrity of what traditional Vermont actually is. 
which is to say a state with some major um, problems and weaknesses and shortcomings, um, but also some wonderful things that down uphillers don't want to see lost. Uh, there's then a section um, I, I wanted you to appreciate. I put some primary documents up that are sort of like the tourist porn of the uh, 19, oh, you know, that era, uh, 1900s, 19-teens, um, which were put out by um, the Bureau of Publicity, which was founded in 1911, replacing as tourism's big promoter, the, the organ of promotion of tourism, the Board of Agriculture. Uh, and uh, the Bureau of Publicity, I put up um, the lore of Vermont silent places and uh, something about the lake country of Vermont. And you can just see the way that the state was being sold in the primary documents folder. And, but the problem is that Vermont's not perfect and ideal like that. Um, exactly then how do you deal with the fact that there are an enormous percentage of the state is French Canadian, either first or second or third generation, or more because, of course, French Canadians saw Lake Champlain before people of English heritage did. And that leads you to the 1909 uh, tercentenary celebration, the 300th anniversary celebration of Champlain seeing Lake Champlain. They wanted to make a big deal about it. Um, you know, President uh, Ginormica William Howard Taft came, and they had big celebrations around the state. But of course, it celebrates Vermont's French heritage. And they actually, on the Vermont Commission to celebrate the 300th anniversary, they put this guy Olivier Beaupre, who uh, was a pharmacist on Church Street in Burlington. And it's really sort of a model, like you cannot sell Vermont as being one thing and pretend that this whole other Vermont doesn't exist. It's not just as a Yankees kingdom. It is indeed lots of people's Vermont and it has French heritage stretching back, you know, Catholic heritage stretching back 300 years. And uh, those people are an enormous important part of the state. You know, how, what do you do about child labor? What do you do about factory conditions? What do you do about the state's shortcomings? Well, that leads us to the 1920s. And in the 1920s, this is section two, um, and I tried to keep this quite short. Uh, the president was from Vermont um, from 1923 until 1929, and his name was Calvin Coolidge, and he really was marketed, marketed himself, was sold as being like archetypal Vermonter, the old traditional taciturn, laconic, industrious, small town person who had made good. And he would come home on vacations while he was president and pitch hay in his tuxedo. And uh, it really elevates Vermont more than ever to like the center of the American psyche in a nation that was becoming modern very quickly. Cinema and radio and mass circulation, newspapers and magazines and all the things that were the 1920s. Coolidge represented a simpler, easier, old America that was very attractive to people. And that was the basis of his popularity. And Vermont was sold for as being the home of people like Coolidge. Um, but the problem is, of course, that there's lots of other problems in Vermont as well. I mean, Wallace Nutting's book, Beautiful Vermont, um, I put up a little thing from that. You can see that Vermont's being sold as being this ideal thing. Uh, it wasn't, though, and so the result was that um, this guy at UVM, in, and this is as much a metaphor as it is a practical thing, but practically it really matters. This professor at UVM, Henry Perkins, launched the eugenic survey. What he did was, he took women who were uh, with the Children's Aid Society, a progressive era reform organization, and had them go out in the field and do um, family trees, genograms, of rural families. And then he identified what their genetic weaknesses were. And this is when the gene theory was very primitive, and so he thought things like pauperism, being poor, uh, sex offenders, uh, you know, I mean, crazy things. Um, that nomadic habits was another one, that these were genetic traits that were weaknesses among these people. And he had pushed through in 1930 as part of this program for the future of Vermont, a sterilization law, which is not exclusively in Vermont. Uh, California had a massive sterilization program. It's very typical of America in the era. But I mean, is this metaphorically and practically what downhillers are gonna do so that rural Vermont meets tourist expectations, are they simply going to eliminate uphill people? Are they going to sterilize them? Uh, there is an article in the articles folder for part four, right, it's in the course materials part four folder, and it's by Kevin Dan, and it's about the eugenic survey. I can't possibly tell you everything you need to know in this short video about it, but I would have you look at that, art, read that article, and, it'll, and also, of course, read in the textbook about the eugenic survey and that will really get you thinking about the question for this unit and I hope you will respond 
by noon on Friday, which is, so if downhillers are selling rural Vermont, if they're selling uphill life, do you think that would make them more sympathetic or less sympathetic to uphill people? Because after all, they are, those are the, that's the valuable product, that's the human landscape that they're selling. But the problem is that if they sell it as this true, wonderful ideal of pastoral beauty and perfection, and it's not actually that, does that make them more frustrated with uphillers than ever? Uh, so that's the question. Did downhillers become more or less sympathetic to uphillers? Logically speaking, what would you expect based on um, the fact that it was uphill life that was the prime commodity that they were selling? And that brings us to the end of this video for Unit 8, and hopefully that all makes sense. And now I'll go grade some papers, if that sounds good. All right.